My name is Aaron Stoner, and for over 10 years, I worked in surveillance and loss prevention at multiple casinos in Los Angeles. I worked and consulted on some of the biggest games in LA, routinely correcting costly errors, as well as thwarting cheaters and identifying scams. I've also worked as a paid consultant, reviewing and analyzing surveillance footage on property theft cases. In 2005, my brother Dallas went missing and has never been seen or heard from since. My mom and I did our best to investigate his disappearance, working with the private detective to no avail. I am not an actor. What you are about to see is real. And all of the still images you see, along with the details I uncover, are sent to law enforcement prior to release. Here are some of my results over the last two years. On screen now are two emails I received from a law enforcement agency thanking me for working on the surveillance footage on a homicide case. Per their request, I overnighted three CDs to the agency containing still images of the killer's face as well as the killer holding the murder weapon. Those still images have been entered in as evidence in that case. This is a case I have never revealed on my channel, for obvious reasons. While I was investigating the unsolved disappearance of Dale Kerstetter, who has been missing for over 30 years, I came across some unidentified remains in Canada that I believe belonged to Dale. Over a year ago, law enforcement in Peterborough, Canada, sent samples of the remains to Pennsylvania State Police, who reportedly are still in the process of analyzing the DNA. I'm including a link to the behind the scenes video I made covering Dale's case in the description below. Recently, my still image analysis on Claudia Lawrence's case was featured in two articles in the North York's Inquirer, written by respected and renowned writer, Tim Hicks. I'm including a link to both of those articles in the description below. In my Elijah Wood detailed analysis video, I revealed numerous details to the public about Elijah's murderer, who was disguised from head to toe. Elijah's case was described by many as being eerily similar to Missy Beaver's case. Just like with Missy's case, law enforcement didn't know if Elijah's murderer was male or female. In 2022, 23-year-old Akil Crumpton was arrested in connection with Elijah's murder, and the details I revealed in my detailed analysis video were proven to be extremely accurate. Nearly a week before Naomi Arion's killer was tracked down and arrested, I sent Lyons County Sheriff's Department these still images of her abductor that I extracted from the Walmart surveillance footage and enhanced. Here are some side-by-side -side comparisons of my still images and Naomi's abductor turned murderer, Troy Driver. Viewers of my Naomi Arion detailed analysis video were the first people in the public to know what Naomi's killer looked like. To all of my supporters and subscribers, I want to say thank you so much. None of this would be possible without you.
on April 18, 2016, 45 year old mother of three, Terry Missy Beavers, was murdered while preparing to instruct a fitness class at Creekside Church in Midlothian, Texas. It has now been over seven years since Missy's murder, and law enforcement have yet to arrest her murderer and bring him to justice. This video is the culmination of over two years of work. I've gone to great lengths in order to find answers and uncover evidence to assist law enforcement in bringing Missy's killer to justice. But I am under no illusion that Missy's killer will be arrested and taken into custody based solely off my work. But someone out there has information that can help law enforcement connect the dots on Missy's case. And this video may very well be the catalyst that causes someone to come forward with that information. Maybe that someone is you. So how did I arrive at my final verdict? Let's start from the very beginning. I had just finished watching Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, a documentary series about the mysterious death of Elisa Lamb. The series spends a great deal of time talking about a guy named Pablo Vaguera, a.k.a. Morbid. For those that haven't seen this documentary series, Pablo's life was turned upside down by people who accused him without any evidence, of being involved in Elisa Lamb's death. The rumors about Pablo's involvement were initially started by a small group of people online. A Taiwanese news broadcast company lifted these rumors from social media and negligently reported them to millions of people around the world. Pablo quickly became the target of accusations, slander, and threats of violence. Like so many viewers, I was enraged and saddened at how Pablo had been treated. His dreams of making it in the music industry in Los Angeles were destroyed. He returned to his home country, hiding away, shying from the lights he once longed for. After watching The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, I went online to find out if there was any update on Pablo. I found this Entertainment Tonight interview with Pablo. I watched it and then jumped down to the comments. While looking through the comments, I came across this comment made by a person named Brandon Beavers. At that point, I had never heard of Terry Missy Beavers, nor had I ever seen anything related to her case. Brandon clearly had an axe to grind with true crime content creators. In this comment, Brandon challenged everyone to Google his name. So, I Googled his name. And that's how I discovered the Terry Missy Beavers case. I did not investigate the details of Terry's case immediately. Because there was surveillance footage on her case, I reviewed that first. Based off the visible evidence in the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage, it was clear to me this was an interrupted burglary. I then investigated more of the details on Missy's case and started looking at what people were saying online about her murder and who may have been involved. Most of the comments were pointing fingers at Missy's husband, Brandon, and her father-in-law, Randy. There were also a lot of people who were claiming that this was a targeted murder committed by a female who was jealous of Missy, but not a single shred of evidence was presented by any of these people to support their claims. I also came across videos where people were doing side-by-side -side comparisons of Randy and the killer walking. Additionally, I saw numerous comments that outright accused Randy and Brandon of being involved in Missy's murder. I quickly understood why Brandon was comparing himself to Pablo Vergara. I went back to Brandon's comment and replied to him with the following. I did what you said and Googled you. I'm sorry you were going through what you were going through. I 100% believe that you and your dad had nothing to do with Missy's murder. I have seen the finger pointing at you and Randy, and it's not right. There is zero evidence either of you had anything to do with her murder. 
just looking briefly at the case for the first time today. I truly cannot understand why anyone would ever point fingers at you guys. This to me is clearly a burglary turned murder. Again, sorry you're dealing with the BS from these internet trolls and quote unquote experts, but I believe you and I'm going to defend you and your dad when I see these a-holes posting. And I'm going to do a genuine investigation into her murder on my channel. I began my analysis by screen capturing the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage, and then analyzed the footage frame by frame. In my downtime, I looked at the press releases and interviews given by Midlothian PD to see what information they had released. Surprisingly, Midlothian PD seemed to have just as many questions as the public. They didn't know for certain the make and model of the vehicle seen driving around the SWFA. They weren't certain if the SWFA driver was connected to Missy's murder. And they didn't know if Missy's killer was male or female. I wanted to see if I could answer any of these questions by critically analyzing the surveillance footage. Within a week, just using basic magnification features on my computer, I could see that the vehicle seen in the SWFA footage is a silver four-door Nissan Ultima 2010 to 2012. I also discovered several still frames in the SWFA footage that show the driver's head. Based off those still images, I was able to determine that the driver is a light skin toned male with a bald or shaved head. Longtime Web Sleuths member No It's Not, who has been working on the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage for many years, released some still images of the driver's head shortly after I released my detailed analysis. Her still images also show a light skin toned man with a bald head backing up what I am seeing. In my detailed analysis part one, I also deduced that the SWFA driver is most likely the same person seen in the Creekside surveillance footage, based off the similarities in clothing and skin tone. Additionally, the circumstances and timing of the events caught on camera at SWFA and Creekside Church on the morning of Monday, April 18th, further supported that they were connected. At around 2 a.m., the Nissan Ultima pulled into the SWFA parking lot, and the driver behaved suspiciously. The driver displayed behavior that is typical of someone who is casing a location. At 2.04 a.m., the Nissan Ultima exits the SWFA parking lot. And 19 minutes later, at 2.23 a.m., motion sensors at Creekside Church were triggered. Still to this very day, Midlothian PD continue to ask for the SWFA driver to come forward and for the public to assist them in tracking down the Nissan Ultima and or the driver. In that first analysis, I also extracted and enhanced this side profile of Missy's killer's face from the Creekside surveillance footage. This side profile gave us our first real glimpse of Missy's killer's facial features. Before moving on, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss the prosthetic leg theory, which is certainly the most controversial part of my Missy Beavers videos. Once again, I want to acknowledge Web Sleuth member No It's Not, who extracted and enhanced these still images from the Creekside footage after I released my part one detailed analysis video. These images that she produced back up what I'm seeing in the footage. Over the last two years, I've received numerous emails and comments from medical professionals, individuals with prosthetic legs, and people who have close relatives who have prosthetic legs. And they stated that they believe Missy's killer does appear to have a prosthetic right leg, more specifically a below the knee prosthetic leg. One viewer who emailed me is a PhD student who works with backscatter radiography and x-ray image processing. He started analyzing the Creekside footage after seeing my analysis, and he arrived at the following conclusion. I believe it is probably a below the knee variety, as opposed to full leg. 
he sent me these two images of Missy's killer's right leg that he had processed. I've also received comments and emails from viewers stating that Missy's killer may be wearing a brace for foot drop, or he has a deformity on his right leg, for example, atrophy. Based off the feedback and information I received after the release of my detailed analysis part one video, I adjusted Missy's killer's profile in later videos to include these additional possibilities in order to cast a wider net. After I uploaded Terry Missy Beaver's case detailed analysis part one, I then decided to take an even closer look at the facts and circumstances of Missy's murder to see if there was any merit to the targeted theory. But everything pointed towards this being a burglary interrupted. In my second video, Was Missy Targeted? I challenged viewers who believe Missy was targeted, confronting them with the evidence and known facts on her case. I'm including a link to that video in the description below. While making final verdict, I've been looking at some arguments being made by supporters of the targeted theory to see if anyone has been able to come up with a strong argument that Missy was targeted. Most of the arguments I have come across are weak arguments that I've already addressed in previous videos. But here are a few that I don't believe I've addressed previously. One argument slash question that I've seen a few times, is why would someone rob a church? While most of us would never think of robbing a church, crime statistics show that church burglaries have been on the rise in the U.S. since the early 2000s, even though the FBI crime statistics show that burglaries and property crimes in general have decreased or leveled out over the last decade. One of the main reasons why church burglaries have been on the rise is because churches are easy targets. Creekside Church is a perfect example of an easy target. It's just off a highway, which allows for a quick exit after the crime. The church is secluded, and the rear of the church is up against a creek and some trees. You can pull right up to the rear of the church, break in, and not have to worry about anyone hearing or seeing you back there. Another reason why church burglaries have been on the rise is because most modern churches contain expensive items like flat screen TVs, projectors, laptops, computers, music equipment, and sometimes money. So yes, church burglaries do happen, and a lot more often than you would think. Another argument that I have been seeing and hearing repeatedly is that if this was a burglary interrupted, then why did Missy still have her wedding ring and other valuables in her possession when her body was discovered? This is a weak argument, and it's an argument that actually backfires on the targeted theory supporters. We know 100% for a fact that prior to Missy's killer being seen on camera inside of Creekside Church, he damaged the rear exterior of the church in multiple locations. Now the most rational explanation for this is that he's a burglar trying to find a way into the building through various windows and doors. Targeted theorists want us to believe that he did all of this damage to the exterior of the church to make it look like a burglary. For argument's sake, let's say that this damage was all planned out ahead of time and staged. So if Missy's killer spent all that time planning this out and went through all the effort of tearing up the exterior and interior of the Creekside Church prior to Missy arriving to make it look like a burglary, he 100% would have taken Missy's wedding ring and other valuables to complete the narrative that this was a burglary interrupted. The only reasonable scenario where valuable items would have been left on Missy is a situation where her killer fled the scene as fast as possible, not wasting any time grabbing up valuables. Moreover, it would work against the burglar turned murderer to take or touch anything after the attack because he might leave DNA, fingerprints, or other physical evidence behind. If this was a pre-planned, staged performance, which targeted theorists want us to believe it is, then he would have pre-planned how to extract those valuable items from Missy without leaving any physical evidence. Now also consider that anything stolen 
especially a wedding ring, iPhone, tablet, etc., could be used to track down or identify the burglar turned killer. So those valuable items that targeted theory supporters keep talking about lose value to the burglar once he attacked Missy. Another argument that targeted theorists have been stating ad nauseum is that Missy's killer seems to be in no particular hurry, and typically burglars get in and out quickly. This is a rather naive perspective of burglaries. Not all burglaries are the same. Typically, the pace at which a burglar burglarizes is dependent upon how much time they believe they have. We know that 19 minutes after the driver exited the SWFA, there was a motion sensor trigger at Creekside Church just down the road. It's reasonable to assume that Missy's killer was testing the alarm at this point. After triggering the sensor at Creekside, it's probable he drove to another location and waited to see if law enforcement, security, or a church member would respond to the alarm. This is typical behavior for burglars. After no one responded to the alarm, Missy's killer returned to the church, confident that he would have plenty of time to break in and explore the church looking for loot. Which explains why Missy's killer was moving at a slow to moderate pace rather than a fast pace that you typically see in a smash and grab or burglaries where there is a small window of opportunity. We must also consider that Missy's killer doesn't appear to be in the best physical shape. Whether you believe he has an injury to his right leg or not, there is no denying this guy is having issues with mobility. Another thing we must consider is the psychology of the burglar. While acquiring valuables is typically a burglar's prime motivation, some burglars have additional motives that can affect how they choose to burglarize and the speed at which they burglarize. Professor David Cantor, director at the International Center for Investigative Psychology, and author of Criminal Psychology, Investigative Psychology, as well as many other books, writes, Some burglars who avoid confrontation are nonetheless interested in the occupants of the building. They rummage through drawers without taking anything and may even destroy property unnecessarily just to insult the occupants. Cantor continues, One young offender that I spoke to made clear that although his aim was to obtain goods of value to sell, he really saw the crime as an adventure in which he was challenging the police. So these additional psychological factors need to be considered, especially in this situation where we are dealing with a church. Cantor's statement about the burglar seeing it as an adventure in which he was challenging the police is of particular interest to me, and I want you to keep this statement by Cantor in mind. I am planning on doing a follow-up video going over the criticisms of my work and questions viewers have at some point after the release of Final Verdict. If you believe you have a strong argument that Missy was targeted that I haven't already addressed on my channel, please leave a comment below and I might address your comment in that video. My conclusion that this was a burglary interrupted was an unpopular theory back in early 2021. I was one of the first of only a few content creators to argue for this theory. Since then, numerous channels that have popped up over the last few years, hosted by profilers and real cold case detectives, have arrived at the same conclusion that I did. And we have arrived at our conclusion of this being a burglary interrupted, based off the evidence. The evidence does not support the targeted theory. Recently, I received a comment from a viewer named Jesse Fry who told me about the murder of Brian Tribble. Brian was a minister at the Center Crest Baptist Church, located in Center Point, Alabama. On October 3rd, 1997, Brian arrived at the church in the early morning hours and surprised a burglar who was attempting to break into the vending machines to steal the cash inside. The burglar shot Brian twice and fled the church without stealing anything from the church. Brian's murderer, Milton Dudley, was captured about three weeks later and sentenced to life in prison.
While making the Was Missy targeted video, I continued to repeatedly go through the surveillance footage, extracting more still images and enhancing them. Admittedly, I became obsessed with the surveillance footage. I would come home from work, load up the footage, and meticulously go through each frame repeatedly until it was time to go to bed. All my days off were spent going through the footage. During a few sessions, I came close to getting a clear shot of the SWFA driver's face at a medium range, so I knew that there had to be something I was overlooking in the footage captured at close range. During one session, I went two days on two hours of sleep. Towards the end of that two day, two hours of sleep session, I decided to start all over again and I focused on the moments in the footage where the Nissan Ultima is closest to the cameras. Sometime between 2 and 3 a.m., as I reviewed this portion of the surveillance footage, I noticed something that I'd never noticed before. As the driver of the Ultima turns right, there is a bright light reflection on the roof of the Ultima, just above the top of the driver's side window. I had seen this light reflection many times before, and my eyes had previously been drawn to it, but this time I was forcing myself to focus on the window only. And that's when I saw something briefly pop in and out of the darkness of the window, just below the light reflection. I zoomed in and replayed this moment in the footage repeatedly, trying to understand what I was looking at. Finally, I realized what I was seeing. The driver briefly leaned into the window and looked up towards the top of the SWFA building. In real time, the driver's movement happened in a fraction of a second. Because of the proximity between the vehicle and the camera, his face can be seen more clearly for the first and only time in the SWFA footage. I believe that the video forensic analyst that Midlothian PD initially brought in to review the footage overlooked this movement because the glare on the roof of the Ultima naturally pulls the viewer's eyes away from the window. Additionally, because only 60% of the driver's face is visible due to the angle of the camera and the frames where his face can be seen are so few, it makes seeing his face next to impossible. Some viewers have mistaken this top portion of the still image as part of the driver's face. This is the roof of the Ultima. To avoid confusion, I've edited out this portion of the image, leaving only the driver's face. After discovering these still frames of the SWFA driver's face, I sent a Midlothian PD detective a link to a private video where I walked him through the footage showing him where to look in the footage to see the driver's face. He viewed this video not once or twice, but multiple times, around 13 times in total. No one else but Midlothian PD and I had access to this video. In the email that I sent to the Midlothian PD detective, along with the still images and the private video, I advised him that I would hold off on revealing this information on my channel for a few days in order to allow him time to respond and advise me what to do next. He did not respond, but a few days after I sent him the email, MPD issued a press release. I'll just read the most notable portions. Midlothian police investigators, are determined to see this case reach closure. Our agency receives tips and leads almost daily from various sources. Our investigators follow up on every credible piece of information. Please know that we will continue to thoughtfully protect the release of information about Missy's murder as long as this case remains open. It is our sincere belief that collaboration with the public is what will eventually lead us to solve this crime. We believe that someone may have a vital piece of information that, to this date, is unknowingly being withheld. 
we appeal to the community to please contact the Midlothian Police Department, regardless of how insignificant they may think their information may be. Some points we would like to reiterate. We do not consider this a cold case. Investigators are actively working new leads and existing case files. This includes coordination with multiple law enforcement agencies and forensic experts. Investigators are still interested in a vehicle captured on video in the parking lot of a nearby business in the hours before the murder was committed. The vehicle of interest is driving slowly around the closed business. The driver turns the lights off and on multiple times and then parks for a short time before exiting the parking lot. After not receiving any response from the Midlothian police detective, in April of 2021, I released the still frames of the driver's face in my video, Terry Missy Beaver's case, The Face of Her Killer. I hope that a viewer might recognize the man and send in a tip to MPD. As an additional tool to help viewers identify the driver, I hired a semi-professional artist to draw a sketch of the driver's face based off this still frame where 60% of the driver's face is visible. This is the sketch the artist created. I then decided to spend more money and hire a professional sketch artist. I wanted to bring in another set of eyes to review my still images, and I also wanted a more refined, higher quality sketch. Based off the still images I gave him, this is the sketch he created. I turned both of these sketches over to the Midlothian PD detective prior to releasing them on my channel. I did not receive a response. Finding Missy's killer's face in the SWFA surveillance footage was like finding a needle in a haystack. There are over 20,000 individual frames in the SWFA footage and there are only about five frames where his face is more clearly visible. After releasing the still frames, sketches, and my profile of Missy's killer on my channel, I didn't want to just wait around hoping someone would identify him. I wanted to see if I could find someone who not only looked like this, but also matched all the known physical features of Missy's killer. This would require Missy's killer's picture to be online somewhere and be clear enough to compare and contrast with the still images and known physical features. It goes without saying, but that needle in a haystack I had just found had just been tossed into another haystack. Based off the evidence I discovered in the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage, I was looking for a light skin tone adult male who was bald or had a shaved head in April 2016. Additionally, he has a hook or parrot-shaped nose. The physical feature that I believed would help me the most is Missy's killer's known height. Law enforcement stated that Missy's killer's height is 5'6 to 5'8, with the boots and helmet on. This places him on a reasonable spectrum of 5'3 to 5'7, without the boots and helmet on, which is below average height for a male in the U.S. I knew that it was probable that Missy's killer wasn't from Midlothian or the nearby area. As I've mentioned numerous times before in previous videos, Midlothian PD turned that town and nearby towns upside down looking for Missy's killer. MPD, along with the citizens who lived in Midlothian and the nearby area, left no stone unturned hunting for Missy's killer. And unfortunately, they came up empty-handed. I decided to begin my search by looking through members' photos on Missy Beaver's Facebook groups. Maybe Missy's killer was hiding in plain sight. But after not finding any possible matches, I decided that the next logical step was to do a Google search for criminals and start going through mugshots. Missy's killer could have been from anywhere. However, based off my analysis of the SWFA surveillance footage and using the process of elimination, I determined that the Nissan Ultima that Missy's killer was driving that morning most likely had a Texas license plate. Therefore, it is most probable that Missy's killer was from Texas, 
And while there was a possibility that Missy's killer had never been arrested in Texas, I believe it was worth it to at least try to find out if he had. I started with mugshots of burglars who had been arrested in northern Texas, primarily in Dallas and Fort Worth. But after not finding a match, I branched out and went city to city throughout northern Texas. The pages of mugshots of burglars in northern Texas seemed to go on into infinity. In order to not get burnt out, I decided to set a goal for myself to look through a few pages of mugshots a day and not spend more than 15 to 30 minutes. I wanted my attention to be 100% and I didn't want to go into autopilot mode because I might overlook something. Months passed and while I would occasionally come across a mugshot that piqued my interest, the criminal was immediately ruled out due to their height or because they were incarcerated or deceased at the time of Missy's murder. But most importantly, none of them looked similar to the man seen in the SWFA surveillance footage. I don't remember what true crime show I was watching, possibly Forensic Files, but one of the real life detectives on the show was talking about how a lot of burglaries are committed by sex offenders. Unable to find work due to their criminal background, a disproportionately large number of burglaries are committed by sex offenders. So I decided to start my search all over, this time using the Texas Sex Offender Registry Map. I began my search once again in Northern Texas, primarily Dallas and Fort Worth. The number of registered sex offenders in Dallas alone kept me busy for several weeks. At this point, it had been nearly a year, and not a single person I came across in my online searches looked like Missy's killer. Throughout 2021, I continued to search through mugshots online, and at one point, I decided to revisit the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage. Going through the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage once more, I was able to find several new still images of Missy's killer that I had not previously discovered, and I was excited to share those images with Midlothian PD as well as with my viewers. Several of the still images captured Missy's killer staring straight into the surveillance camera with his mask down. Just like with the silhouette image I had extracted and enhanced, his facial features in these new still frames once again matched up with the features of the SWFA driver. I'd received a lot of questions and comments from viewers over the years on my Missy Beavers videos. In December 2021, I started writing the script for a video titled Terry Missy Beaver's Case 2022 Q&A. I planned on showing the new still images to viewers as an added bonus. I finished writing the script and had filmed most of the video when one day during my downtime, I decided to look through some mugshots online. This time I tried a completely new Google search. The Google search I performed was Sex Offenders Texas and then I clicked on the Images tab. On the very first page that came up, my eyes were immediately drawn to one man's face in the top right corner. The man's name is Robert Brian Crisman.
I immediately contacted Midlothian PD, advising them that I believe I had identified the man seen in the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage. I included side-by-side -side photos, as well as Robert Brian Crisman's physical stats and some of his criminal background. I did receive a response from the detective, simply stating, Thanks. Robert Brian Crisman was born in 1962 and was 53 at the time of Missy's murder. He is a light skin tone male with a parrot shaped nose and a bald head. He is 5 foot 5 and weighed approximately 180 pounds in 2014. Crisman has a scorpion tattoo on his right arm, a cut scar on his chest, and additional cut scars on both wrists. Crisman is a career criminal. His criminal history includes felony unauthorized use of vehicle, felony third-degree theft, and felony third-degree violent sex offense. When Crisman was 18 years old, he kidnapped, abused, and raped a 17-year-old girl. He then held her for ransom, demanding $4,000 from the girl's parents. Crisman held the teenager for ransom for 12 hours while the girl's family tried to get the ransom money together. When Crisman went to pick up the $4,000 ransom that had been left in a phone booth, police moved in on him and arrested him. During the arrest, Crisman fled on foot, and when a police officer caught up to Crisman, Crisman attempted to stab the arresting police officer, Earl Rigby, with a knife. In 1981, Crisman was found guilty on multiple charges. At his sentencing hearing, prosecutors asked the jury to sentence Crisman to 80 years in state prison. However, Crisman was ultimately given a 55-year prison sentence, which included an additional 10 years for the attempted stabbing of the Corpus Christi police officer. Five years into his sentence, Robert Brian Crisman attempted to escape from prison along with three other men. The men were working on a maintenance crew and overpowered a guard, hitting him over the head, and then they tied him up. Crisman and the other men then stole horses and fled on horseback. Crisman, along with the other three prisoners, were eventually recaptured, and Crisman was given additional time for his escape attempt. 26 years later, in July 2012, Crisman was paroled, and within a few months, he went on the run after failing to comply with sex offender registration requirements. Two years later, in July 2014, Crisman was placed on the Texas 10 Most Wanted Sex Offender List. And then on November 10, 2016, around seven months after Missy Beavers was murdered, Robert Brian Crisman was arrested in West Hollywood, California. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Department pulled Crisman over for a traffic violation and discovered that he was a wanted felon in Texas. This is a mugshot taken of Crisman at the time of his arrest in 2016. Crisman was extradited to Texas and incarcerated again, and he has remained in the Texas prison system since. He is currently imprisoned at Telford State Prison, a little less than three hours away from Midlothian, Texas. Crisman is currently 60 years old and is not projected to be released from prison until 2032, when he will be approximately 69 years old. Prior to being imprisoned at Telford State Prison, Crisman also spent time in the following Texas state prisons. Beto Estelle Huntsville and Polonsky. In 2019, Robert Brian Crisman was up for parole. However, his parole was denied. The parole board concluded that Crisman had repeatedly committed criminal episodes that indicate a predisposition to commit criminal acts upon release. Additionally, it was noted in his parole hearing that in the past, Crisman has displayed elements of brutality, violence, assaultive behavior, 
or conscious selection of victims' vulnerability, indicating a conscious disregard for the lives, safety, or property of others, such that the offender poses a continuing threat to public safety. Lastly, Chrisman had unsuccessful periods of supervision on previous probation, parole, or mandatory supervision that resulted in incarceration, including parole in absentia. Chrisman was again up for parole in 2022, but was denied again for most of the same reasons as previously mentioned. In 2022, I hired a private investigator to look into Chrisman's background. There was nothing discovered in that background check that directly linked Chrisman to Missy's murder. But the detective did state that he suspects Chrisman may have been using someone else's identity while he was on the run. The private detective stated that because Robert Brian Chrisman and his father have almost identical names, Robert Brian Chrisman may have been using his father's identity and personal details while on the run. In December 2022, I filed a Public Records Act request with the L.A. County Sheriff's Office requesting the incident report for the traffic stop involving Robert Brian Chrisman that led to him being arrested and extradited back to Texas. The request was unfortunately denied. My request was denied because in California, police arrest and reports are exempt from disclosure, except to victims or their representatives. Chrisman was pulled over for a minor traffic violation involving only himself. Therefore, no victims. I reached out to two private detectives to help me acquire this incident report, but they were both unsuccessful. I want to view this incident report because I want to see what vehicle Chrisman was driving at the time of his arrest in West Hollywood, as well as acquire the license plate information on that vehicle. Unfortunately, there was no mention in the news article about the vehicle Chrisman was driving during that traffic stop. In early 2023, I attempted to acquire information on Chrisman's medical history, but due to HIPAA regulations, I was not able to acquire his medical details. There currently is no video footage available of Robert Brian Chrisman walking, so it is not possible to compare his gait to Missy's killer's gait. In all the pictures I have seen of Chrisman, they all show him from the knee up. In early 2023, I contacted Telford State Prison, where Chrisman is currently imprisoned, and I spoke with someone in the warden's office who stated they cannot give out any information on inmates whatsoever. I followed up by asking if I could speak with Chrisman over the phone or visit Chrisman in prison, and she stated that only people on Chrisman's personal list can contact him or visit him. From 2012 to 2014, Robert Brian Chrisman was known to do odd jobs in order to make money. But after being placed on the top 10 most wanted list in 2014, he was no longer able to work many of these odd jobs he had previously performed. Hypothetically, since Chrisman was unable to find work, he may have gone back to burglarizing, seeking out targets at night in order to keep himself afloat. Considering that Chrisman was a top 10 most wanted felon in April 2016, and he had a distinctive tattoo on his right arm, and noticeable cut scars on his wrists. He would have wanted to conceal his identity and avoid detection and capture at all costs. From 2014 to November 2016, Chrisman's whereabouts are unknown at this time. The private detective I hired was unable to find any known address for Robert Brian Chrisman, other than the addresses where he lived growing up. Because Chrisman refused to register as a sex offender after his parole in 2012, law enforcement may not be able to track down his whereabouts from 2014 to 2016 either. Earlier in this video, I talked about the murder of Brian Tribble. When law enforcement asked his killer, Milton Dudley, why he chose to kill Brian instead of just fleeing the scene, Milton stated, it was because he had seen my face and could identify me. Hypothetically speaking, if someone had happened upon Chrisman while he was burglarizing, 
his primary motives for attacking someone would have been to avoid identification and capture. Crisman was facing additional time in prison for being in violation of his parole agreement, and if charged with burglary while on the run, Crisman would be looking at life in prison. Many have asked, why hasn't Missy's killer struck again? Why haven't we seen other burglaries and or murders involving someone who is dressed like this and or walks like this? Well, one answer is that Missy's killer is dead. But another more probable answer is that he may be in prison. Robert Brian Crisman was arrested in West Hollywood, California, approximately seven months after Missy's murder, and he has remained in the Texas prison system since. On screen now are three images labeled image one, two, and three. Images one and three are the same still frame image of the SWFA driver's partial face. To make things easier to explain, in image three, I'm using letters to represent specific locations on the SWFA driver's face. Image two is a photo of Robert Brian Crisman which has been cropped to show roughly the same portion of his face as images one and three. Important to note, the SWFA driver's face is slightly turned to his left, while Chrisman is facing straight ahead, making it difficult to compare the distances between the regions of their faces precisely. With that being said, the slight difference does not take away from our ability to gauge if the regions of the driver's face are similar or dissimilar to Chrisman's face. The left eyebrow of the driver, which is located in region A to B, has a similar thickness and shape as Chrisman. The distance from the corner of the left eyebrow of the driver, labeled B, to the tip of his nose, labeled D, is also similar to Chrisman. The thickness of the bridge of the nose of the driver is similar to Chrisman as well. The width of the driver's nose from his left to right nostril, located between E and D, is similar. Additionally, the shape of the nostrils are similar as well. The distance from region A to the tip of the driver's nose, labeled D, is similar. The distance from the driver's left nostril, located in region D, to just below the lower lip located in region I is similar. The distance from the tip of the nose located in region D to the left and right side of the driver's mouth located in regions G and H is similar. The distance from the tip of the nose located in region D to the upper lip on the driver's face labeled F is similar. The distance across the driver's lips, labeled G to H, is similar. Additionally, the sides of the mouth called the oral commissures are similar. The thickness of the driver's lips are similar as well. The region under the driver's bottom lip, called the mental labial sulcus, is similar. Looking at region I to J on the driver's face, the distance is similar.
Note the dimple, crease, or scar on the driver's face located here is similar. Additionally, the shape slash roundness of the driver's chin is similar. In my comparative analysis of Robert Brian Crisman's face and the SWFA driver's face, I did not observe any facial feature that is dissimilar. Missy's killer's known height is 5'6 to 5'8, from the floor to the top of his helmet. Factor in an inch to three inches max for the helmet and boots, and Crisman's known height of 5'5 falls reasonably within that spectrum. Crisman's light skin tone matches up with Missy's killer's known skin tone as well. Important to note, the parole board criminal psychological profile of Crisman lines up with the known behavior of Missy's killer. Additionally, Crisman's prior violent behavior when being caught in the act lines up with the known behavior of Missy's killer. Crisman attempted to stab a police officer who caught him in the act. What do you think he would do to a civilian who had caught him in the act? Often the best way to predict someone's behavior is to look at the person's prior behavior when in a similar situation. I didn't start from the conclusion that Crisman may be involved in Missy's murder. I'd never seen or heard of Robert Brian Crisman prior to Googling Texas sex offenders. To arrive at my final verdict, I followed the observable evidence and known facts, and it led me to Crisman. Once I discovered Crisman, my goal was then to find ways to rule him out. As of the making of this video, I have discovered nothing that rules him out. It's unknown at this time if the Midlothian PD detective I've been emailing shared my information with other investigators working on Missy's case. I emailed the detective the information on Crisman in January of 2022, and then I went completely silent on Missy's case for over a year to give him time to look into Crisman. According to U.S. criminal researchers, police only solve 13% of burglaries nationally and only 12% of burglaries are planned. Most thieves who have been caught admit that breaking into a location was an impulse decision. On top of this, roughly 50% of homicides go unsolved annually in the U.S. One of the primary reasons why homicide cases are going unsolved is because assailants are unknown to the victim and guns are being used more frequently. The use of firearms increases the physical distance between the victim and the unknown assailant, thus leaving little to no physical evidence behind. According to MurderData.org, Missy was killed by a handgun. While it is possible someone entered this data incorrectly, I believe we can say with a high degree of certainty that Missy was killed by a handgun and not blunt force trauma that was rumored for many years. If Missy's killer was a burglar passing through, who has no connection to Missy, no connection to Midlothian, and he used a firearm, leaving little to no physical evidence behind, then it's no wonder Missy's case has gone unsolved for so long. Midlothian PD had the deck stacked against them from the very beginning. It has been seven years since Missy was murdered. I believe it is safe to assume that there is no solid DNA evidence. I've seen it stated that there was DNA found at the crime scene, However, the specifics of the DNA recovered has never been revealed by law enforcement. This could be DNA from churchgoers, or it could be mixed DNA found on Missy's clothing that could have come from persons other than her killer. If there is no solid DNA evidence, the only chance for an arrest and conviction of Missy's killer will be via someone coming forward with information. This information combined with the surveillance footage evidence, gate analysis, 
still frame images of Missy's killer's face, and circumstantial evidence may be enough to achieve a successful arrest and conviction. If you have any information regarding the murder of Terry Missy Beavers, please call Ellis County Crime Stoppers at 972-973-7297 or contact the Midlothian Police Department Criminal Investigation Division at 972-775-7634. There is currently a $150,000 reward for anyone who comes forward with information that leads to the arrest and grand jury indictment of the individual who murdered Missy Beavers. If you have any information on Robert Brian Crisman, please call the Midlothian Police Department Criminal Investigation Division at 972-775-7634. If you don't want to speak with law enforcement, you can always contact me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com and you can remain completely anonymous.